All right, children, may you have a wonderful time with your teachers. Uh, thank you, teachers, uh, devoting your time and energy uh, to these uh, precious young ones. And uh, the rest of us, we have an opportunity to uh, open up our Bibles to, where do you think we are in the preaching series? Psalms. At least we have that. We've learned something coming to church. All right. Psalms, a series in Psalms called Our Hearts Cry. Uh, these Psalms are, they are songs, they are hymns that prompt us to cry out to our God. And so we have one today that is a heart's cry. Psalm 46. So go ahead and turn in your scriptures to the 46th Psalm. And uh, we're just going to say a few things about this Psalm. And uh, then we'll get into it. Uh, so uh, Psalm 46. So turn there in your Bibles or on your device. And um, do you see, first of all, before we jump into it, uh, that we have this uh, superscript or title, and um, it says here, to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. Okay, do you pay attention to those, by the way? Not, not really. Uh, Adriana says not really. Very interesting. These superscripts, we wouldn't want to say that they are inspired. Um, like the actual psalm itself, but they are very important. Uh, they were added at a very early time when those who were compiling the psalms, this psalm probably goes back to around the time of David, 1000 BC, and probably around this time that was affixed to this psalm, this, this superscript, and they help us to understand, they tell us about the authorship sometimes, the context, the intended use, so Pay attention to those. And by the way, in your German Bible, some of you are following along in German, good for you. Um, you'll notice that verse 1 starts with the superscript. Okay, so when you're reading from the German Bible, it gets a little confusing. In the Psalms with the superscript, you've always got to do a plus one. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, in the English Bibles, it's not a part of, it's not an actual verse number. So anyway, what does it say here? To the choir master. Okay. Who is the, who's the choir master? Well, 55 psalms have this in the superscript, to the choir master. And uh, the choir master referred to the leader of the temple, singers and instrumentalists. So picture the glorious temple, and you would have singers and those playing instruments, and you had to have someone directing them. And that was the choir master. So this is a psalm to the choir master. And then it says... Uh, of the sons of Korah. Who are the sons of Korah? Remember Moses. Moses had a nephew named Korah. And did it go well with Korah? That's a very sad story that we won't get into. No, he rebelled and it didn't go well. But now, 500 years later, his descendants, his sons, are leaders, they are a key accomplished musicians in the temple. And here they are, unlike great, 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 great granddaddy, they are praising the Lord and they are being used and uh, they are the sons of Korah. And it, this psalm may have been written by one of those sons of Korah. And then we have according to Alamoth. What in the world is that? Anyone know what an Alamoth is? Come on, you, but Christy, you didn't study this in Bible college? Neither did I. It's, it's only mentioned here and in 1 Chronicles 15. Only two places in the Bible, and it literally means a young woman. A young woman, and the thought is, Alamoth is someone with a beautiful, um, high-pitched soprano voice. And so this psalm was to be sung by the Alamoth by the young woman with, uh, with these uh, beautiful soprano voices. Do we have anyone here who could... Who could you, you would do that. Okay, wonderful. You'll do the Alamoth for us. Yeah, or it may have not been an actual... We don't know. It could have been an instrument too. A high-pitched instrument that sounded like a melodic, beautiful female voice. So either way, it was uh, 
parts of it anyway were to be set sung this way. And you can almost picture, be still and know that I don't know how they did it. Uh, but uh, some parts of it, you don't want the female voices or the high-pitched instrument, the seas roaring and the mountains moving. But parts of it, there is a river whose streams. Can't you picture the contrast? So beautiful. No, you can't. Sorry about that. By the way, I was talking to Becky and I was wondering in heaven, will, will these things be sung and played like they were back in the original context? Won't that be? I think so. We don't know what it was like. And there are a lot of songs based on this. We're going to sing one today at the end of the service, a famous one. But I don't think any of them hold a candle to how it was in the original. Okay, so that's a little bit of the, the superscript. And uh, the, the, the structure, the, this is a, uh, by the way, it's called a Song of Zion. There are several songs of Zion. And Zion is uh, just, it's, it's the largest hill on which the city of Jerusalem is built. Sometimes Jerusalem is called Zion. I remember visiting Jerusalem and our tour guide said, now you are on Zion. And I thought, whoa, this is, it's a, it was a parking lot, but it, but it was Zion. And so this is one of the songs of, of Zion. And uh, the structure of this song it's a song like we have stanzas or verses when we sing songs, right? And we have choruses. Well, this, this has that. It has three stanzas. Stanza one, verses one to three. Stanza two, four to seven. Stanza three, eight to eleven. And how does each stanza end? With Selah. And Selah means, we're not sure exactly, but most think, and I think it's right, pause and reflect. So you get to the end of your stanza. Ah, oh, Selah. Pause and reflect. And then stanzas two and three end with a chorus. Because every good song has a chorus, right? And what is the chorus? The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That is the chorus that we have two times in our song. And by the way, this song is very special too because it's connected with, uh, we'll circle back to this in a little bit, Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther, there are several anecdotes that tell us this was one of his favorite psalms, if not maybe his favorite psalm. He often turned to Psalm 46 in troubling times. And there's one story that um, Psalm 46 became his bedrock psalm. Uh, especially during the year 1527. And some of you know what happened in 1527. The bubonic plague swept through Europe. It came to Germany. It came to Wittenberg, where he was. As a matter of fact, in response to this, there were several uh, Christian leaders in Wittenberg who, who began leaving. We're getting out of here. People are dying, dying all around us, okay? The mortality rate was much, much higher than the coronavirus. People were leaving. And so it uh, prompted Luther to write a pamphlet, whether one may flee from a deadly plague. And he encouraged Christian leaders to stay at their posts. Now, in this pamphlet, he also talked about purifying the air and trying to avoid people when possible social distancing. So there was some common sense to it, but it's like stay put and care for the sick. And by the way, the choice to stay there resulted in the loss of Martin and Catherine's little baby daughter, Elizabeth. So think of that. But sometime between that year, 1527 and 1529, Martin Luther, remember, he's being inspired by Psalm 46. He writes his most famous song, his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And there are several stories as you're reading about this. Have you heard about his friend, Philip Melanchthon? You go to Wittenberg, there's the Melanchthon house. Uh, Luther was just the creative genius, just spinning out things left and right. And somebody had to kind of keep him controlled a little bit. And that was his little buddy, Melanchthon, also very brilliant. But this was his best friend. And he would often say to Philip, come, Philip, let us sing the 46th. <laughs> I just... I, I just about cry when I hear that. Come, Philip, let us sing the 46th Psalm. <laughs> and uh, by the way, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to come, church, sing the 46th Psalm with me at the very end if I can get through and uh, preach this sermon. We're going to go outside and sing this song, okay? Are you with me? All right, socially distanced? 
We're going to be outside. Okay, wonderful. Here we go. Well, let's, let's get into the, uh, the psalm. And uh, we're just going to do a very simple outline here. And I'm, Becky was invited to speak at a ladies conference in the spring. And because of COVID, it didn't happen. But she was going to speak on this psalm and she already worked on an outline. And so she let me have her journal and I said, honey, is it okay if I just use your outline? Uh, And so here's her outline. She gets the credit. And by the way, Franz, it's alliterated, but I didn't do it. It's, It's hers. The first point, verse number one, God's promise. Second point, our predicament, verses two to seven. Third point, God's plea, verses eight through 11. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, read this psalm. And would you stand with me and you just read it. Uh, We're allowed to read. Um, You read it. If you read it in German or your native tongue or another version, I'm going to try to say it from the ESV, but that's okay. It might be confusing to us, but you just belt it out. Psalm 46, and then we will pray. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains are moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. And the God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Oh, our Lord, we take comfort knowing that You are our refuge. Troubling times back then. Troubling times now. But the one thing that is common is, oh Lord, You are our refuge. May we look to You now as You speak to us from this ancient song. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, we're going to just start here with verse 1. And in verse 1, we have the promise. God's promise. We have a threefold promise from our God. Uh, number one, God is our refuge. <laughs> He's our refuge. And what that word means, it's just simply safety. Freedom from danger. A place of shelter. It can literally mean a, a physical hole. <laughs> to crawl into. God is our place of shelter. I, I think When I was studying this, I was thinking about those precious people um, in that camp, Moria, the camp burning down, some 12,000 people now fleeing out in the open along roadsides and, and in the fields. <laughs> and if they will go to Him, God is their refuge. God is our refuge. Anyone who will run to Him He is our refuge. By the way, let's keep praying for Andy and Dana as they're working with these uh, precious people. You see in the news, some of you have followed this. uh, Unbelievable. But God is their refuge if they will run to Him. God is our refuge, number one. That's a promise. God is our strength. And what that word means, it's this idea of fortification, a a strong hold, um, a, a bulwark. Um, that's, they're, they're both places of safety, but one is this kind of obscure little hole and the other is this massive uh, fortress. God is, is both the safe place to reside against attacks. And it's not God gives me strength. He is my strength. All right? There's a difference, right? He is that. So we have refuge and we have strength 
And then we have very present help in trouble. And I love this. The, the Hebrew behind this is, is that which just comes and appears and shows up suddenly. Uh, when you think you're alone, boom, help is there. That's what the word means. And so you bring all this together. And I guess Christy in your children's talk, which we didn't get to hear, she was going to talk about how you've got an omnipresent God. Uh, you've got a God who's very present, right? Before that, though, you've got an omnipotent God. So remember the omnis? We have omnipotence, omnipresence, and we have omniscience. You have two of those omnis right in here. Omnipotence omnipresence, but there's something else that um, if we just had only those two, if you had a very strong being who could show up at any time, but who is quite like mean, that would be uh, actually not a good thing, right? That would be very frightening. And so here's another word. If you're going to say, if, <laughs> if you're going to do the omnis, some people say there are actually not three, there are four and there's something called God is an omnibenevolent God, okay? Can we say that? He is omnibenevolent. All right, so just a good English word to learn. I, what, what is it? All gutish. That's just ganz einfach auf Deutsch. Normalerweise ist das nicht stimmt. Okay, so uh, God is, uh, he's a loving God. He's, he's all powerful. He's everywhere present but he's all loving. Aren't you glad we have all of those wrapped in one? He is our God. Threefold promise, refuge, strength, very present help in time of trouble. That is the promise. And that kind of sets the tone for this whole song. This is the promise we can keep going back to. Oh God, you are my refuge. You are my strength. You are my very present help in trouble. So that's the promise. And then as we go through our song, we find out that we are in a predicament. And what a predicament we are in. We're mainly, there are two things that we see, two big themes. The first is in stanza one here, um, and it's in verses two and three. And the first predicament is just the fury of nature. Nature can be quite scary. The fury of nature, number one. Then number two this is in the second stanza, verses 4 to 7, the distress of nations. So one has to do with nature, the other has to do with the nations. This is the predicament that we're in. And, and it's, it's very interesting, uh, the, you, you see some beautiful parallelism in here, in this, we can't get into all this, but I, I was just fascinated, in stanza 1, you have the mountains trembling in verse 3. Then in stanza 2, you have the kingdoms tottering in verse 5. So both with, with nature and the nations. There's this Hebrew word that brings this out. Um, the mountains trembling, the kingdoms tottering. So anyway, let's talk about this first predicament, the fury of nature. Okay, Nature's fury. I don't know if any of you have experienced nature's fury. Um, I remember one storm I was in that scared me to death. Uh, nature's fury. Earth, look at these descriptions, verses 2 and 3. The earth giving away, mountains moving into the sea, roaring, foaming, swelling waters that make the mountains tremble. And what comes to your mind when you hear this description? You think of both earthquakes and tsunamis, right? That's what you think of. Uh, they were a, a fear back then. They are a fear now. Uh, I, I have never been in an earthquake. I don't know if any of you have. I was reading a, a eyewitness account. There was a guy that was in an earthquake that came that hit uh, Kathmandu a few years back. And here's what he wrote. And I thought it was just so descriptive of what it would be like to be in. And have, have any of you been in an earthquake? Several, several of you have. Okay. Maybe you can relate to this. Here's what he writes. Fear, you can see it in people's eyes. Earthquakes are strange. An earthquake, not like a tornado or a volcano or flood or a hurricane or any other major natural disaster. You cannot see an earthquake coming. You get no warning. There are no alarms to give you a 10-minute heads up like a tornado or tsunami. An earthquake just happens. It comes out of nowhere and it affects everything. The earth is shaking under your feet. 
but danger is everywhere. The building you're in, the walls outside, the floor beneath you. That's about as bad as it gets. There are a lot of things. Nature's fury can be awesome. But an earthquake, maybe there's nothing quite like that. Even coronavirus, we're afraid of that. But at least you can go somewhere and isolate. I saw a picture of one guy walking around in, through the airport with a bubble. Um, he, okay, he, I, I guess he was safe. I don't know. But uh, with an earthquake, where do you go? Yet, look at this. Though the earth gives way. Four times there's the word though. Though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved. Though the seas, waters roar and foam. Though the mountains tremble. Though nature unleashes its fury, we will not fear. Um, why will we not fear? Because we have a very present help in time of trouble. The earthquake just comes out of nowhere. Guess who comes quicker than the earthquake? The help can even beat the earthquake, right? We will not fear. In Luke 21, Jesus prophesies that one of the signs of the end times before he returns is that people will faint with fear and with foreboding of what is to come. So as we go into end times, as we approach the day that Jesus returns, one of the signs is that people will faint with fear. People will be characterized with fear. Remember what this guy said? You can see it in their eyes. And, and, and this is what we see even with this pandemic. There's fear. But God's people, we are to be different. We are at one with the one who is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And by the way, Jesus in this same passage, he mentions that there will be other things that will come in the end times. He says great earthquakes. He says the seas and waves will roll. And he also says there will be pestilences. So these things that we're experiencing, they will continue to come and, and even increase before our Lord returns. But we do not need to fear. Now I remember, I, I was uh, uh, this was several years ago, and if we just put these words up on the screen, they did the... <laughs> They, I was at some youth rally and the speaker actually printed these out for all the kids to take away. And, and you look at it and it's like, what does that mean? No fear, no fear. I don't know what that even means. But it's stuck in my head. So I thought, okay, if it's stuck in my head all these years, I'm just going to give it to you guys and maybe it'll stick in someone's head. No fear, no fear. So here's the idea. You know, the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're not supposed to fear the Lord like you would fear a monster or an earthquake or a tsunami, but, but there is this, this healthy respect for how awesome our God is. And once you begin to understand the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of walking down the path of wisdom. Once you know God in that way, you have this reverent respect for God you know the fear of God, what begins to happen as that increases, then what decreases is the fear of other things. So you know the fear of God, that increases, you, be, you will begin to have no fear of other trouble. So maybe that will stay in your head. No fear. No fear. So that's the first predicament that we're in. The fury of nature. And it's not going to go away, right? And so here now is the second predicament that we're in in verses 4 through 7 of our song. 4 through 7. Look at this. Um, uh, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High, so peaceful there. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. But then this leads right into what's happening now in the second stanza. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. So we have our second predicament. Not only is there this nature's fury happening, we have here the distress of nations. The, the description here is uh, 
the, the psalmist is talking about wars and conflicts between nations. It alludes to empires and nations falling and, and governments collapsing. And by the way, this is another uh, sign of the end times. Actually, it's referred to in Luke 21 as the distress of nations. And that's why I just gave it the name here. It, it, that, that phrase just captures this. The distress of nations. Jesus says in Luke 21, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In Matthew 24, 6, he says there will be wars and rumors of wars. And people, this is happening. Um, it seems like we, we, we've maybe lost sight of it with the pandemic that we're in, but we are in a time of the distress of the nations. I, I was just looking at this put this chart up here if we could. This is from the United Nations website. The claim is that in 2016, so this is four years old obviously, in 2016 more countries experienced violent conflict than at any point in almost 30 years. And you could just see the graph, how this thing is moving up, starting after World War II there, climbing, uh, at least we have data up until 2016. You see a pattern here, the distress of the nations and people, according to Scripture, it's not going away. It's something that is here. It's a predicament that we are in. And as we think of wars, the collapse of nations, what a feeling of fear and insecurity that we have. Do you, can you identify with that? I was back in the U.S. and, and, and someone said, what was it like? And I said, it was a special time of bonding with my country but I said, in a lot of ways, I felt like I was in the ICU uh, room with my dear friend. And, and, and almost like watching my, my country die. And I don't want to be say doom and gloom here, but I, I, it, it feels like something shifted in, in my home country. And I, you know, all empires come and go. Um, and I feel like, wow, it, it, what's happening with, with my home country coronavirus and how we're dealing with civil unrest, economic volatility, on and on. What is going on? And yet, in the midst of all that, does that bring a sense of fear and insecurity to you? But in the midst of all that, this psalm speaks to us. In the midst of that, look at this in verse 4. There is a river <laughs> whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. So, such beautiful poetry happening here. In verse 4, there's a river whose streams make glad as opposed to the roaring and foaming sea. In verse 3. In verse 5, we have a city that will not be moved as opposed to the mountains being moved. In verse 2. But what is this? God is in the midst of the city. <laughs> What's happening here? What city is this? Anyone know? You might say, well, Jerusalem, right? That's the obvious answer. Jerusalem. Okay, let's, let's think about that. I'm, I'm going to say yes, and, but Jerusalem. Think about Jerusalem. Uh, is the present city of Jerusalem, um, or, or, or think of the past, Jerusalem and all of its past. Does this fit the description? Is it a city that has a river flowing into it? Um, wow. And this is very important. When a city was being sieged, uh, to have a river was uh, something that was very essential. It would provide a means to survive. Drinking water, fish, etc. But, but here's the deal. Jerusalem does not have a river flowing into it. Okay, uh, Only a few small streams. Let me ask you this. Is Jerusalem present, past, a city that has not been moved when attacked? No way. During its long history, Jerusalem has been attacked, uh, attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, besieged 23 times, and destroyed twice. This speaks of Jerusalem, but this does not speak of the Jerusalem present or past. What is going on here? See, the description of this Jerusalem points to something else. It points to a city that the prophets speak of. Ezekiel 37. In Ezekiel 37, he speaks 
of a coming Jerusalem with a river flowing through it. John picks up that prophecy in Revelation chapter 22. It's in your prayer guide. Let me just read a few of these verses. Revelation 22 verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river, the river flowing into Jerusalem, the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb and down the middle of the great street of the city on each side of the rivers to the tree of life and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. This is speaking of a city yet to come. The city of God and there is a river that will flow to this city of God who will make the people glad once and for all. This is a city that will never be overthrown. God will help her when the morning dawns. I love that that phrase right there. Because when you think of war times, you're fighting through the night, and you just hear uh, destruction all around you, and you're waiting for the sun to come up to see how bad it was. The sun comes up with this city, and it's like, Everything is intact. It's okay. Why? Because God is in the midst of this city and this city is not going to be moved. And God has brought help even when the morning dawns. And let me just say this, even now, do you realize that you are a part of that city to come? You might say, well, that's a future city. You've got a connection to that city now. Uh, Here's what Paul tells the church in Philippi, but our citizenship is in heaven. Present tense. You may be a citizen of some country here on earth. We're all residents of the city of Berlin, but guess what, brothers and sisters, if you are in Jesus, your citizenship is in heaven. You are a part of this heavenly city. The city of God. The city whose streams make it glad. The city that will not be moved. The city that has God in the midst of her. This is your city. In the meantime, as you're here on earth, dealing with your predicament, the fury of nature, the distress of nations, you're looking for a better country. A heavenly one. You're like Abraham in Hebrews 11. You're looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Amen? And then we, we come to something else. Not only is God in the midst of the city, also in this stanza, the Lord of hosts is with us. If it wasn't enough that God was in the midst of the city, now we have in verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. And I don't know if you appreciate that expression, the Lord of hosts. But that's about as awesome as it gets. You've got the word Lord. That's Yahweh. That is the most sacred, uh, powerful name of God in the Holy Scriptures. And then you have Yahweh connected with leading the hosts of heaven. Uh, Chris Tomlin, the song that we sang, he, he refers to as the, the God of angel armies. Uh, so you, <laughs> you have Yahweh leading the angelic hosts. I mean, it doesn't get more awesome than that. I love in the Christmas story, you know, the beautiful story of the shepherds on the hillside. And then this angel shows up. And then, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, what would that have been like for those poor shepherds on that Bethlehem hillside? Uh, we, we have no idea of the power of these angels. I was reading recently in Isaiah and poor Judah I mean, Israel's already been besieged by Assyria. Assyria is the most powerful empire of the day. And then now it's Judah's turn. And we're coming to get you. And you have Hezekiah and the people. And all they can do is just, just cry out to God. And uh, somehow when it seems all, it's all going to fail, there's just this little uh, snippet in the story. Uh, and the angel of the Lord struck down 185,000 Assyrian stories. And boom, that's it. They're, they're okay. It just happened like one angel of the Lord. So you don't mess with one. You certainly don't mess with a multitude of heavenly hosts, and you don't mess with the Yahweh who's leading them, and this is the one who's with us, people. He's with us. Emmanuel, 
is with us. Oh God, we praise You. The Lord of hosts is with us. And then I love this. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We, we, we go from one extreme to the other. Because He didn't say the God of Israel. He says the God of Jacob. And it's really interesting. A lot of Bible scholars have pointed this out. When you think of Jacob, you think of the, the stooped, downcast, limping man. Remember, you will no longer be called Jacob. You will be called Israel. But here he's referred to Jacob, hearkening back to his humble origins. And don't you feel like just Jacob? Downcast, stooped, limping. Well, guess what? The God of Jacob is your fortress. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So in the midst of this predicament, the fury of nature, the distress of nations, <laughs> God is with us. And then we come to uh, the very end of the psalm and we have the plea. And this, this is different. Uh, starting with verse 8, uh, it, it changes the last stanza. You'll notice uh, th there are these two sets of imperatives. And uh, that makes it unique from uh, any other part of the, the psalm. We have these imperatives. And, and the first imperative is come and see. And the second imperative is uh, be still and know. So that kind of helps us uh, grab hold of what's going on in this stanza. The, the first imperative is this. Come and see. So it's like all this stuff is happening in the psalm. You've got the fury of nature, the distress of, of nations. And then the psalmist, it's actually God through the psalmist, he's given this plea, come and see. And, and often, isn't that what it takes for us to come and see God? When we see the display of His power and, we, and we're in the midst of suffering, here's what C.S. Lewis says is, if we have this quote here, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is His megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So all these things are happening. And then the psalmist is crying out, come and see. Come and see. And, and what are we supposed to see? Well, we're, we're going to see that our Lord in the person of the Messiah Jesus is going to come as judge of all the earth. It's going to happen, people. He's going to come. This, it's not just going to keep going on like this. He is coming back as a judge. Verses 8 and 9, Come, behold the works of the Lord. He has brought desolations on the earth. That's speaking of His coming judgment. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. This is all very graphic language stating that our Lord is going to return to earth as the judge. We read this in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven opening, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and, in, and in, his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the wine presses of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming as the judge. This is God's word. But not only will he come as the judge, he will also come, and we see this here in our song, he will come as the prince of peace. The Prince of Peace. Verse 9, He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. Another prophecy from Isaiah 2, verse 4, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, 
nor will they train for war any more. He and He alone will usher in world peace. He will do what the League of Nations, the United Nations, the world of court has never been able to do. Just like that little rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. (laughs) Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. All the earth's politicians and all the earth's statesmen cannot put this world together again. But we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, who will finally fix things. He will put this world together again. There will be a day, according to Scripture, when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And then we have this. It flows right into it. The second imperative. Come and see. And then we have be still and know. After all this, after we behold this awesome God, what can we do but be still and know? Be still. It's not just simply being quiet. It it literally means to let go. to, To drop. It's like the disciples when Jesus beckons them to come to Him. They immediately... They dropped their nets to follow Jesus. It, it's a more proactive posture of quieting yourself before God. It's, it's, it's getting alone with your God. It's casting all your cares on Him. It's pushing aside that smartphone. Be still. And as we be still, we, we know. Be still and know. And what do we know? What he says to us is, I am God. And isn't that enough? (laughs) What else is there to know? I am God. A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. (laughs) What else is there? Be still and know that I am God. I am God and you are not. We come to him and we find that he is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our very present help in trouble. We have this sense, oh God, you've got this. I'm facing scary things, but you are, you show up faster than the earthquake. You're a very, very present help in time of trouble. And then not only do we know that he is God, the second thing we know is this. He says, I will be exalted. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. What an assurance that is. I will be exalted. There will be a day, Scripture says, when every knee will bow before His name and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. He will be exalted. People don't believe Him right now. People blaspheme Him, ignore Him. But He will be exalted. There will be a day when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ and He shall reign forever. There will be a day when, according to Isaiah 11, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, this psalm is very prophetic. This psalm speaks of of three future events that are going to come. Number one, Jesus will come as the judge. Verse 8. Number two, Jesus will bring peace and establish His kingdom on earth, verse 9. Number three, Jesus will be exalted throughout the earth, verse 10. It's the Word of God. And then the song ends, it goes back to the chorus, verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. (laughs) The God of Jacob is our fortress. And how can you respond otherwise but to pause and reflect, Selah. So uh, concluding now, we, we live on planet Earth and we're facing troubling times. Um, this is nothing new. Way back, the, the first book, the, very likely the earliest book in Scripture written, the book of Job. Job says this, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Trouble is just part of human existence 
And we believe it's going to only increase. Paul tells Timothy, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. But in the midst of these troubling times, we have a refuge. Let me ask you this. Is the Lord your refuge? Is He your refuge? Do you know Him? If you do not know Him, I just I say along with the psalmist, come and see. Come and see Him. If you do know Him, I, I say along with the psalmist, be still and know Him even more deeply. Are you allowing space in your life to all the more to be still and know that He is God? There's a couple questions for us. Is He your refuge? What we're going to do, we're going to circle back to uh, the beginning of our uh, sermon if we could. And uh, I don't, I'm ready to sing. I don't know about you. I'm ready to sing in church. And as Martin said, the church isn't this room. The church is wherever the people of God are. And remember, we talked about uh, Martin Luther, um, Psalm 46 being special to him, very special psalm he would turn to in times of trouble, and how this inspired the writing of one of the most famous hymns of all time, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott. And um, I want to say to you what Luther would say to his friend. Luther would say to Philip, come, Philip, let us sing the 46th Psalm. So I'm going to ask you, come, church, let us sing the 46th Psalm. Could we do that?